Um, so in terms of talking about difficult coworkers, I thought a great way to start off um, would be to uh, ask you to think about the range of problems that you face at work. Okay? Think about the range of problems, morale problems, communication problems, <coughs> quality uh, problems in terms of customer relations. Okay? So think, get all those different problems in mind. And then ask yourself, what's the source of most of those problems? What's the source? And then my final question, does that source have a name and a face and do you have to work with or for them? Does it have a name and a face and do you have to work with or for them? Um, what I found in doing this work is that there's a tremendous amount of discussion in the popular press about difficult coworkers. This was a quote that I found from a Washington Post article. Uh, dealing with difficult coworkers, the ones who are simply unpleasant people can make workday taxing for everyone. And sort of goes through some more descriptions. And these are some of the books that I found on this topic of toxic workplaces or dealing with difficult coworkers. This is just a smattering of the ones that I own. I actually had a student working with me in the fall, and she pulled together a bunch of different references on this. So there's a lot of work or a lot of information out there in terms of the popular press. But interestingly enough, we don't really know a whole lot empirically. And as a scientist, I always want to know if we're going to be giving advice to people in business, is it based on data? Does it have something to back it up? And so I went looking in the literature, the academic literature, to try and find out what do we know about difficult coworkers. And what I found was a lot of work on things like abusive supervisors. That's been a hot topic for the last 10 years. There's work on incivility in the workplace, social undermining, bullying, you know, those kinds of things. Um, a little bit on people who are poor performers. Um, a little bit on uh, who are people who are likely to be unethical in the workplace, but that's really pretty much about it. There isn't a lot directly dealing with this topic of difficult coworkers. And so working with a doctoral student in the program, Debbie Searcy, um, I decided this would be a good opportunity to start exploring this topic. And so we started on a quest to interview people about their experiences with difficult coworkers. And we wanted to answer a couple of questions. Who is a difficult coworker? What do they do that makes them difficult? And what are the consequences of that difficulty for other people in the workplace? And as I go through this, if you have questions, please feel free to jump in and ask. You can stop me at any point. We're going to have time at the end for questions as well. Um, but I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So those were our questions. Who is a difficult coworker? What do they do? And what are the consequences? So, I'm not going to go into detail too much about the study unless you have particular questions about it. But we started off interviewing part-time MBA students um, in the program, um, and also some EMBA students. And then as we sort of collected a critical mass, we wanted to make sure that we included a wider range of occupations and a wider range of ages than we would typically find in our MBA program. So we ended up, we focused on professional, technical, and managerial jobs. Uh, and as you can see, we had you know, managers, consultants, we had IT people, financial specialists. Um, but we also had an attorney, we had a physician, a couple of teachers, a nutritionist, a TV producer. So we really wanted to get a wide range. And these folks worked at a huge number of different companies, from very small to very large, including government agencies. So we just wanted to see across a, a spectrum of folks, um, you know, what, what were their experiences. Um, we ended up interviewing 46 total people, um, ranging in age from 27 to 64. So good spectrum there. And uh, the, we have, I have the breakdown in terms of uh, uh, diversity. And our interview questions were, we started off asking, have you ever worked with somebody that you consider to be a difficult Coworker. We tried to encourage people to participate, even if they didn't think they had worked with somebody. You know, so we're trying to stack the deck here. But everybody that we asked said yes. And we asked them to describe those individuals. And uh, we ended up with descriptions of 80 different difficult coworkers. And so our questions got very specific. When did you first think this person uh, was a difficult coworker? What did they do? What did they say? What makes them difficult as opposed to merely annoying? Like, we wanted to separate out the difficult people from just, oh, we've got a slight personality conflict going on here. And then what were some of the consequences of those incidents at work? So this is what we ended up finding. Um, 
in terms of who is a difficult coworker. Um, who is a difficult coworker? There's somebody that you come into contact with in the office. They didn't fall into any particular role, like they weren't all supervisors, they weren't all peers, they weren't all subordinates. Um, in some cases, they didn't even work for your organization, right? They were clients that you had to deal with. Or um, people, there were a number of cases of people who were working on teams where the members of the team came from different organizations. And sometimes it was somebody who was working for a completely different organization that people had to work with um, in order to accomplish their jobs. So the key issue was really having contact with the person at work. It wasn't what role they were in, but it was really having that contact. And in some cases, the contact was even virtual. We had uh, two respondents who described virtual coworkers. And in one case, they never actually met the person face to face, right? But they had to work with them. Uh, virtually, and what the person did ended up making them um, difficult. So, someone that you come into contact with. Second thing that was really interesting was that there was consensus. So, the people who we interviewed were not the only people who thought that these individuals were difficult. They had had conversations with other people about the difficult coworker, and there was a lot of agreement, a lot of consensus that this person um, created problems. And in a number of cases, the person actually had a reputation as being difficult. Okay? And people would hear about this reputation before they ever actually had to work with the person. Um, so that we thought was pretty interesting. So it seems as though when you're dealing with difficult coworkers, um, other people are pretty willing to tell you, this person's a problem, you better watch out. Uh, the third thing is, what did they do to be difficult? We found they violated people's expectations about appropriate behavior at work in one of six different areas, and I'll talk about those in a minute. And what we found is that in 100% of cases, people violated other people's expectations. And sometimes it was, I've worked with other people who are in a similar role, and they don't act this way, or I've had prior, you know, prior people that I've worked with who don't behave this way or don't create these sorts of problems. Sometimes they felt that the person violated professional standards uh, in terms of appropriate workplace behavior. They talked about the, this, the fact that the workplace was really tense when the person joined and things got a lot better once they ended up leaving the organization. So in every case, they violated expectations about how to behave at work. And then finally, I think this is really the critical one, they led to a detrimental impact in terms of other people's job performance. So it wasn't just the case that I don't like this person, I don't enjoy interacting with them. In every case, they had some sort of impact on other people's ability to perform their jobs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So let me go through a couple of these um, in terms of who you come into contact with in the work environment. What we found is that you can find difficult coworkers all throughout work organizations, okay? So you'll see, so 6% were actually the CEO, owner, partner, or the agency head, like the top decision maker inside the organization. 22%, um, 22.5 were managers or supervisors. <coughs> and sometimes there were a couple of levels up. It wasn't always just the direct supervisor. Sometimes it was a couple levels higher than that. 26% of the time they were peers, and they could be peers that you had to work with closely as well as further out. There might be people in other functional <laughs> units who you had to come into contact with to do your job. Um, in 25% of cases, it was direct reports, people who were working for um, our respondents. 9%, they changed status, which means uh, relative to the respondent, they might have been the, the boss and then they became a coworker, or they were, they were coworkers and then the respondent got promoted to a boss. And in a couple cases, you know, one of the difficult coworkers got promoted and then demoted. So there's, a, you know, some ability to change roles over time, which I think really highlights the fact that it's the contact that you have, not the particular role relationship. Um, the same team, different employers, so clients are those cross-functional teams, and uh, a surprising number of administrative assistants. These were not people who our respondents directly supervised. Um, but it's amazing the amount of chaos that a, a, a difficult administrative assistant can cause. Yeah. So, being a difficult employee does not have anything to do with your ability to gain success. Is that what we're saying? Yes. Well, I guess it depends on how you would, I mean, in terms of financial success or titles. Yeah. 
Although we did find uh, a significant number of these individuals quit, fired, or were disciplined or demoted, like almost 50%. So some did get ahead and some didn't. Yeah. So uh, I assume that being like overly manipulative and some of the things that will help you climb the ladder that are obnoxious and maybe difficult. <laughs> Well, remember, we interviewed we interviewed people who worked with them, so we didn't actually interview the actual person. I mean, I'd like to be able, you know, as we go further, to extend our data collection so that we have a better understanding of that. Um, my impression is that sometimes people who were difficult had other, there were other things that gave them power in the system, and um, sometimes the that... Yeah, so I can think of one uh, director level person in a government agency who was politically connected in the D.C. area and uh, was at that SES level and they just ended up reorganizing her out of having any subordinates as a way, because they, it was probably prior. Yeah. Have you worked in the government? Yeah. Other questions? Just feel free to jump in. Yeah, I, I sort of have a question. Is, you can have an organization with a certain culture, and then these people come in who are difficult, they're disruptive, their toxicity spreads throughout the organization. That's one thing. But what about organizations that are truly culturally dysfunctional as opposed to having you know, one person that's rocking the boat? Yeah, I, I think based on the interviews that we did, I think we saw both dynamics. Um, and I can think of a couple, particularly when the top decision maker was a problem, then a lot of other people. The higher the person was, and I haven't looked at this closely yet, but the higher the person was who created the difficulty, it's almost like a, I describe it almost like a child abuse model where you grow up being abused and so you become an abuser sort of dynamic. And so I think the higher the person was, the, the more you saw dysfunctional behavior among other people, or at least that was what our respondents reported to us. Now, I'd like to be able to back that up by, you know, interviewing <coughs> multiple people, um, but that's at least what the data suggests. But, you know, if, if you're a normal person and you come into that environment, and clearly you see it starts at the top, you don't have a serious <coughs> chance, and the best thing for you to do is, is leave that environment. That would be my conclusion, actually, based on the people we interviewed. And we talked to some people who really suffer, really suffer. I mean, my, the, our interviews ranged in length from 30 minutes up to two hours. And I remember at the end of one two-hour interview of a person who worked for a fairly toxic organization, he said to me at the end, thank you, that was very cathartic. <laughs> you know, my spouse, my friend, they don't want to hear about this anymore. <laughs> so, yes. I guess I'm trying to figure out what makes them how you define difficult behavior, because in my experience, some of the most difficult employees are people who are incompetent in some fashion or mm -hmm. not cut out for the role in which they find themselves, but they're just really nice people, they try really hard, yes. they just can't do the job. You so, like them personally, but professionally, they're just not there. And that's actually more difficult than tyrants. And tyrants. You're, you're absolutely right, and these are the behaviors that we found that tend to make people difficult. And so we definitely had examples of people who could have performed their job, but were otherwise nice people. So let me talk a little bit about these behaviors. And what we realized is we went through the interviews in you know, minute detail, trying to pull out the different dynamics and categorize them to see what were the trends. So one trend, as you might not be too surprised to hear, had to do with this interpersonal behavior. Okay? So people who are aggressive, disrespectful, hostile, and friendly, um, clearly they make the workplace uh, pretty uncomfortable for other folks. And uh, uh, Joe, with the, the toxic corporate, the toxic small company, I, I brought a quote um, that a, the two-hour interview, the person that I interviewed for two hours said, uh, that the top decision maker used to say, he used to say, I'm sure you have many opinions, we're not interested in any of them. That was his uh, stance with regard to employees in the organization. <coughs> um, but we had a number of others, um, and some of them were sort of funny. We have, um, had an example of a, 
high school teacher who had a difficult coworker who was a band teacher, and he would send students into the hallway to practice their instruments while classes were in session. <laughs> and had been reprimanded about this many times, but that didn't really seem to stop him. Um, we had another example of uh, an elementary school teacher um, who was tenured, and there were state-mandated curriculum changes that were going into effect, and she refused to work with anybody else um, in terms of implementing those particular changes. Um, we also had, you know, a lot of examples of people who were very insulting to others, who would make comments publicly in front of others that were humiliating. And as you can imagine, that doesn't exactly lead to very good morale in the workplace. One of the things that was interesting was um, this issue of communication. And it seems obvious on the one hand, but not quite so obvious, or at least not from an empirical research standpoint is that people who have communication difficulties, they violate our expectations about how we communicate, can really create a lot of problems in the workplace. So people who use email, for example, to communicate sensitive topics, or they're too loud, um, or they talk too much. Most people have kind of had an experience of a coworker who just talks too much, and you're trying to back away. <laughs> they keep talking, and you're like, I have to go get some work done. Um, and people who don't listen well. Um, and what we found is that sometimes those go along with those, inter those bad interpersonal behaviors, but other times the problem was just that the person had a great deal of difficulty communicating or communicating effectively. And one of the most salient examples was a guy who was very nice um, person, but talked in technical jargon, and he was in the IT unit of a large uh, government, semi-government, semi-private organization where clients, internal clients, would come to them to ask them to do different projects, and his response was always heavy in terms of the jargon to the point where it would cause the clients to say, that sounds like too, like it's too much, like it's too scary, we, we don't want to do this, and they would end up going external to the organization in order to get their IT needs met because of this guy's communication problem. So communication difficulties were another area. The third one is probably won't be too surprising to many of you if you've had experiences with some of these folks. Problems with emotional self-regulation. So this included people who would blow up or who got very angry and they'd have outbursts um, at work. But it also included people who were chronic complainers or chronically moody or chronically depressive at work. Um, I remember one responded who said, you know, like we're, we're working with the clients and we're excited and this person is always um, talking about how horrible the clients are and it just brings down the whole mood of the team to work with this person because they're chronically complaining in terms of what's going on. And then the final one is drama. These are people who are very dramatic at work. So they sort of live their life large at work and so everything is all about me. They draw a lot of attention to themselves and are very dramatic in terms of their responses. Um, one at the top here in terms of control of information, tasks, or resources. Um, not too surprisingly, people who are micromanagers came up quite a bit as those who were difficult coworkers. So, you know, excessive monitoring of work. We had a couple of cases where people said, every single email I sent had to be CC'd to this person, or anything that I did all day long, I had to document it and send it to the person. So, very high level of detail management. But also behavior at the other end in terms of people who were very disorganized. They also created a lot of problems. So sort of the free spirit types who really weren't managing work processes, weren't scheduled very well. Um, and in some cases, um, in a lot of the more damaging cases, these people were in supervisory positions where they weren't really providing a lot of direction or guidance to their subordinates. And the subordinates didn't know, like, <laughs> What do we need to do? When do we need to get it done? What's the schedule? And so that's, I think of it as a continuum. You know, there's too much control and too loose control. And both of those seem to create problems for our respondents. Um, fifth one is self-interest, um, which I, what we found is that people who fit into that category tended to be all about me, all about myself. They put their own needs ahead of the needs of the work group or the organization. Um, in terms of the decisions that they made or the way that they handled themselves, and in some cases would make you know, very unethical kinds of decisions. Uh, one of the more stunning examples was the case of a woman who was, uh, the, this was the very toxic firm with the toxic person at the top, 
Uh, but they had a property, a district property manager who was driving a company vehicle and it was a brand new truck and drove into the garage and damaged the side of the vehicle and um, didn't report it, but she had a maintenance worker who was in the car with her and he reported this incident. And so when they came to her and said, what, you know, what's going on, she said, oh, well, he was driving. Now, the maintenance worker didn't speak English very well. But fortunately for him, there was video of this incident, and so it became very apparent who was actually driving. And interestingly enough, and maybe as an example of how dysfunctional this organization was, they didn't fire her. They actually put her in charge of the HR department wow. <laughs> in the company. That was weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> and when I asked our respondent about it, he said, well, it's not like HR, like we studied it at this, this school. It was more sort of the, the paperwork angle of it, but that way she didn't have a responsibility for supervising anybody. But pretty amazing uh, likes that people go to. Um, so, uh, we also had cases of people who tried to poach clients. You know, these, uh, I remember talking to a person who was in a headhunting firm, um, recruitment firm, and they brought in somebody from the outside, and the person, when they came in, came in at a higher level, and immediately, if she'd had a relationship with any of their current clients, uh, before she came to the organization, even if current consultants had a relationship, she would claim that those were her clients, so she was able to get the fees for placing those individuals. So you see sort of that dynamic of people being very self-interested and really crossing ethical lines in terms of um, their decision making. Um, another case, this was a, an organization, a small transportation organization, um, where the owner uh, hired our respondent, and when he hired him, he promised that he would have health insurance coverage. And so the respondent, after working there for several months, ended up having to go to the emergency room for something relatively minor. Turned out he wasn't covered. The guy had never actually followed through and covered his health insurance. Um, so you see a lot of those dynamics in terms of, I'm going to put my needs in front of your needs and cross the line ethically. Um, the final area is, is really your issue, work performance standards. Um, and these had to do with people who um, didn't put in very much effort or they got easily overwhelmed at work. In some cases it seemed they really <coughs> probably didn't know how to do the job. They may have misrepresented themselves on their resumes and gotten hired and then gotten in really over their head. But also, um, you know, people who showed up with inappropriate dress. We had uh, <clears throat> one case of a difficult co-worker who was an administrative assistant in a professional office in a Baltimore company who uh, started showing up wearing a baseball cap to work, okay. um, among many other kinds of things that she did that were problematic. Um, so it can really be a range of different things. On average, what we found is that most people violated expectations in more than just one area. There were a few people who just, you know, just violated work performance standards or uh, just violated interpersonal behavior standards, but most people violated more than one of these sets of standards, and on average it was about 3.75 different violations that these people had. So you can imagine how that increases the level of difficulty if they're aggressive and hostile interpersonally, unethical, and um, have communication problems or emotional self-regulation problems. Um, this might be a slight tangent, but when you talk about people that are in a position or a role that they're not qualified for or not able to do, mm -hmm. um, how how often is that the case of the persons, or if there's the fault to be blamed, is that it's that person misrepresenting themselves as opposed to the company poorly managing a person and putting them, setting them up to fail? It's, it, it's, it's hard to say just from the interviews that we did. There were, I can think of one or two cases where it seemed that the person may have misrepresented their qualifications when they were hired because they started off not being able to to perform the job. Um, the case of the administrative assistant who wore the baseball cap, uh, she had been transferred from another part of the company and <coughs> had thought she was going to be the executive assistant and then ended up being the administrative assistant to the entire office of about 40 people. And uh, the, our respondent thought that that was sort of her way of getting back, like you've 
kind of given me a less prestigious job, and so this is sort of my way of responding. So there's some motivation and some ability dynamics that are in there, um, and it's, it's hard to know for sure kind of what flips the switch in terms of making the person, you know, become more difficult. All right, so those were some of the things that uh, difficult coworkers do that makes them difficult. I'm going to talk a little bit about the consequences of their behavior, I guess in two parts. One is the more immediate consequences of their behavior. And this was uh, particularly interesting because a lot of to us, because from an academic perspective, a lot of the research is just focused on, well, if people are uncivil at work, it causes stress for everybody, right? And so we were seeing like tangible spillover effects in terms of other people's performance, right? So this wasn't the difficult coworkers' performance, this was their impact on other people in the workplace. And so a big one had to do with time or efficiency problems. Um, because of the ways that they were difficult, the communication problems or the interpersonal sorts of problems, um, people needed time to decompress. You know, there were a number of cases where there were emotional outbursts and the person said, I just had to leave for the rest of the afternoon. I was so angry, I was so upset, I couldn't get anything else done. But also delayed work um, because they couldn't get work from the other person or the things that they were doing delayed progress in terms of their own work or having to work longer hours, and in a number of cases, having to miss deadlines because of problems that were created by the difficult coworker. Either they hadn't finished their piece, or the piece had to be redone, or it had to be monitored, or something along those lines. So over 50% of the cases involved time delays. The, the difficult coworker created time delays for other people. Were quality problems. These tended to fall into two categories. One is the distraction category. So if you think about the teacher who's in the classroom while the band students are going up and down the hallway playing their instruments, obviously there's some distraction there. It's hard to concentrate. If you have a chatty or difficult, a chatty difficult coworker, that person comes and talks to you and you're, you're thinking, I've got to, you know, I'm distracted, I can't get things done. Or sometimes when people were very loud and they were talking in a, you know, in a, in a cubicle environment, and that created distractions for people in terms of being able to get their own work done. Um, but then there were also the case where the person said, you know, this person's really difficult and I'm just not going to put in any effort on their task. Their, their jobs go to the bottom of my pile. Uh, if I get around to it, I'm just not going to put as much effort into it because they're taking up so much of, you know, they're, they're creating problems or difficulties. I find this very interesting, and what I think is uh, is probably the, one of the most challenging things that you had to look at was actually segmenting the uh, the consequences and, and how this occurred. Can you tell me whether or not you looked at the uh, the tolerance level, or did you get a sense of the tolerance level? It might have been more uh, uh, qualitative than quantitative that people gave to the difficult coworker if their if their um, behavior was uh, um, something that you could say that you related to being too chatty. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll let that go for a while. We'll let that go for a while. We'll let it yeah. go. We'll let it go until you miss, you know, a, a deadline. Right. And then there's others who, you know, the, the, the terrible person who comes in and is just a, a real problem that, you know, immediately that's that's addressed. Did you see that, that in those particular cases there was that, that length of time that, that people yes. would give? There is, in part because if you think about most of these behaviors, other than the work performance standards, people often are not confronting, they're not comfortable confronting people who violate their expectations in these areas. So if you have somebody who's really rude to you, most people kind of step back and, and they don't say, you know, that was really rude. <laughs> I think you need to apologize. So I think that there's sort of a, a zone of silence. And we did ask people how they dealt with their difficult co that they and others in the workplace have they dealt with a difficult coworker. And the number one response, you probably won't be too surprised to hear this, avoidance. Right? I just stayed away from them. And so I think in some ways, to the extent that you do that, it sort of creates that bubble around the person where maybe they're not getting the feedback that they need, that these sorts of expectations are being violated in ways that create problems for others. So you, you almost don't even know then what the consequences are unless there is some objective standard that you can base on. Whereas yeah. the, the organization could be doing so much better 
but you don't know what it really could be doing because everybody's avoiding and, and trying yeah. to move around. So. Yeah. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, but um, in a lot of cases, our respondents felt that the people higher up or who were in a position to do something about this were aware that there was a problem, but really didn't want to get involved. And I think in a lot of cases, they regarded it as, um, oh, it's just a personality conflict. Go work it out yourself. You know? I, I remember talking to um, one respondent who sat in a cubicle next to somebody who was constantly making very loud racist and sexist jokes and comments and so forth. And he felt offended, and he wasn't the only one who felt offended, and he went and talked to his manager about it, and the manager said, well, why don't you talk to him? <laughs> so he kind of put it back on the person. Um, and, you know, eventually, this is one of the few cases where, I mean, he did talk to the person, and, and the behavior actually didn't change, but eventually the company moved the difficult coworker to a different cubicle so he wasn't distracting um, and annoying the person next to him. All right, so I talked about time and efficiency problems, quality problems. The, the workaround issue was huge, and I, maybe in part because so many people avoided difficult coworkers, they just didn't want to have to deal with them. And that ended up creating a lot of problems with communication flow. So I might need to go to Kristen to get some piece of information, but because she's a difficult coworker, I have to pick on you, I'm going to go to Broth instead to get that information. So, I'm, you know, there's this constant looping around uh, that's going on that leads to coordination problems in a lot of organizations. But there are also a number of cases where we had people who said, I just won't delegate anymore to that person. Like, I can't trust them to do the job or I can't trust them to do things properly. Um, so I'm not going to delegate to them. And a number of cases where people just said, I'm not going to work with this person at all. There's a, <laughs> a, a, a really stunning case of a difficult coworker who was pretty high up in a large financial agency and they actually reorganized to put her by herself with the respondent because our respondent was the only person who was able to work with her. Nobody else would work with her. She would have these blow ups and she'd get very angry and she was very smart but nobody else could learn from her because she would have these constant interpersonal problems. Um, and it ended up affecting the transaction flow within the organization. Nobody could learn from her. She wasn't able to leverage their talents or capabilities. And it was really a problem. And she eventually quit, um, you know, which I think made everybody very happy. So need for workarounds um, creates a lot of issues. And then the final one is just a flat-out increased workload. So we found there were a lot of cases, especially with micromanaging, where tasks ended up being duplicated. And people felt like, you know, why am I putting in this extra time? Or they had to complete work that the difficult coworker hadn't completed, or they were having to step in to handle those issues. And in a lot of cases, um, time that was taken or additional work that was required because people had to have meetings to resolve the problems that were created by the difficult coworker. Um, so I can think of one respondent who said, you know, it seems like every two weeks we have to spend an afternoon resolving all the problems that were created by the difficult coworker over the last two weeks. You know, you have to have a full staff meeting to deal with those issues. And people felt like that was very unproductive. So those are kind of the more immediate problems that difficult coworkers create. They also had a pretty substantial impact on the functioning of their organizations. We found in 51% of cases, the difficult coworker led to these efficiency, work quality, work around, increased workload problems in ways that spilled over onto customers, okay, or that became noticeable either internally or externally to the organization. So in terms of impact on internal functioning, uh, the TV producer uh, that I interviewed, her editor, um, was kind of a micromanager, um, snarly type person, and would get very upset whenever changes in a story would come. And, you know, how come I wasn't told about this? And this, the respondent said, it's called the news because it's new. <laughs> because <laughs> you can't anticipate when these things are going to happen. And so she would, um, she would refuse to work on the story to get it edited, um, the, you know, the video and the sound edited down um, until she was confident that there weren't going to be any more changes to it which caused them to send it out to the affiliates late. And so a lot of times the affiliates would already be on the air before the program would go out. Okay? So that's one example of how this, you know, problems in terms of 
terms of internal functioning. Missed deadlines, you know, that could cause spillover effects in other parts of the organization. And disruptive levels of turnover. Uh, one of the government agencies where the person was politically protected had a 400% turnover of the professional staff. Okay, this was the professional staff. 400% turnover. And in that agency, they ended up starting to hire secretaries <coughs> out of state because when they did that, the person had to make a commitment to stay for a year. That was the only way they could get the secretaries to stay for a year in this organization. So you can see that it's not just sort of that immediate work group. It's having significant spillover effects on a lot of other people. <coughs> Financial consequences, late fees, rush costs. Um, contractor fees. We had several cases where people had to hire people outside the organization to perform some of the tasks that have been assigned to the difficult coworker. Um, and opportunity costs. Uh, there is one uh, agency head of a nonprofit who uh, wouldn't make decisions, like really couldn't sort of bring herself to make decisions. And so she'd had numerous recommendations about, well, how about if we shift our funds into these higher yield bank accounts, or how about if we rent out this unused office space that we have, and she wouldn't make a decision, you know, which leads to some pretty significant opportunity costs over time. Um, and then, of course, there's the uh, impact on client or external relations, and this was um, really shocking to us in some cases. Um, we had one case of a company that um, was a, a consulting company where they lost the contract due to the difficult coworker who was the primary consultant on the project and the client was so upset that they refused to pay the rest of the contract okay so not just a lost customer but an angry lost customer under those circumstances we had another case of a bank manager who had a difficult subordinate who had been given a responsibility for the key to the cash vault and he failed to show up to work on Black Friday, you know, the day after Thanksgiving. So they had no access to cash for that um, particular event. So the customers are coming in saying, how can you be a bank and not have any access to cash? Right? It's directly attributable to that person. Um, so a lot of those kinds of issues. But then even more than that, we had a, an attorney who worked in a district court and the judge was the difficult coworker in this case. He had a two-year backlog of cases that had not been resolved, and in some cases, the ca the cases were actually missing or forgotten. Okay, because he would hang on to these cases and get into political battles with the other judges. Uh, we had a, a case of uh, students uh, <laughs> with the band teacher also had a tendency to hold students back, and they missed. Or, or were delayed from taking state-mandated exams required for graduation. I mean, <laughs> these are not like minor kinds of things going on. We had one case uh, with a medical doctor who uh, had difficult interns working for her who refused to answer a page when they had a child that was in a health care crisis. These are not minor kinds of things that are going on, um, you know, in terms of difficult coworkers and these sorts of problems that they cause. So, one question. Um, yeah. You, so you've mentioned a couple of times about organizational avoidance, where once these issues have been identified, the organization avoids doing anything they have to do, where they restructure the organization around the person, they just move mm -hmm. them to a different box. So they don't. Um, were you surprised by how often that happens, as much as you think about you know, private sector or public sector being you know, efficient and management and ruthless and all those other sort of things, but it seems like they <laughs> so, am I surprised about the rate at which organizations don't do anything? Um, I teach negotiations, and so uh, one of the things that I've found over the years of teaching negotiations is that people are often reluctant to step into conflict. And um, so from that standpoint, it didn't surprise me. What surprised me was that it often took those really severe outcomes in order for the company to act and, and terminate them. That, that was actually the thing that surprised me more. Um, you know, I think people, after having interviewed uh, 40 some, and we actually did another small study um, where we interviewed 10 people in a small organization, and they had a difficult coworker who had left a couple of weeks prior. Um, so we've interviewed, you know, close to 60 people at this point now. Um, and I guess the, um, 
it's people seem to feel comfortable dealing with performance problems. So if you can't do your job or you make a mistake in terms, you know, you have an error that leads to some accounting problem or something along those lines, people feel comfortable saying, okay, you aren't doing your job and you're going to be terminated for that reason. They don't feel comfortable a lot of times saying your interpersonal behavior is inappropriate or your communication is creating problems or friction in the organization or these emotional outbursts are disrupting the staff. They don't seem comfortable um, addressing those issues or terminating people for them because it's almost like they, they view the job almost too narrowly. It's just the job performance and not the fact that there's a larger coordination issue that has to go on. That's the thing I think I feel is So what can you do about difficult coworkers? This is uh, an area that I want to say up front. We have limited empirical data on this. I know what the um, respondents told us uh, when we interviewed them, but we haven't subjected it to more rigorous empirical examination. So these are my thoughts based on the people that we interviewed in terms of what should you do when you're dealing with a difficult coworker. So I think the first um, issue is to identify who they are. And um, not too surprisingly, it doesn't seem to be that tough because people know who they are. <laughs> and it really, it seems as though all you have to do is ask uh, in order to get people to tell you. Um, but I think once you've identified who they are, I think the next critical step is to have that conversation with them about their behavior. And a lot of times when we asked our respondents, did you talk to the person directly? And they didn't. They were the concern was we're afraid we're going to make it worse. It's already bad, and if it gets worse, it's going to be really horrible. So they sort of had that fear that if I do anything to address it, it's going to create worse problems. But I think the thing that they often fail to understand is that if you don't address it, you're sort of implicitly condoning it. You know, expectations we sort of figure out by watching other people, and a lot of times we don't talk about them until we see somebody violate our expectations and then we'll turn to our coworker, or peer, friend, mentor and say, what is going on with this? And that's sort of when you discuss it. Um, and so I think what happens is if you don't address it, you, soon, you send a signal not just to that person but to other people, this behavior is okay, right? We're not going to do anything if you're aggressive or you have these sorts of emotional outbursts. And because people don't talk about it, the difficult coworker really gets that message reinforced. It's okay to behave that way at work. Okay? So I think you have to talk about you know, the difficult things, the interpersonal, the emotional, some of the ethical things, the communication problems, just as much as you need to talk about the performance side of things. And then I think it's really critical to explain, here's why I'm talking to you about this. I'm not saying you're a bad person or you have a bad personality. But here's the spillover effect on other people in terms of their ability to get their job done. And I think if you can make that link, it becomes much easier for them to, to build a case that would survive a legal challenge if one were to erupt, that um, you know, if we need to terminate you, we are terminating you for performance because you're having a spillover effect on these other people. And then I think you have to hold them accountable for the change. You know, set the boundaries in terms of what's acceptable behavior and then when they violate that, I think you have to call them out on it, um, which is uncomfortable for a lot of people. Do you think companies should maybe take a more macro approach and try to nip it in the bud to begin with and yes. have some sort of formal training? Yes. Because I know, like, coming from the Smith School, we had a pretty good background in how to act, how not to act. But, like, when you're out in the field and seeing a bunch of clients, they don't necessarily get that. Maybe went to different schools. And it's kind of <laughs> obvious that, <laughs> it's kinda obvious that um, that if companies did take the onus on themselves from the onset, that maybe these difficult type situations wouldn't come up as much? Well, I think that's true. And I think especially if you say up front, this, these are the parameters of acceptable workplace behavior. These are the professional standards we expect you to adhere to. And if, if firms did that on an ongoing basis, I think it makes it much harder for people to transgress those expectations, you know, or step outside of them. Because you've sort of been warned and other people have been warned and so, you know, if somebody kind of violates that, then it's sort of helpful to pull them back into the line. So I think that's a great suggestion. I don't know if we can totally get rid of difficult coworkers. You know, one of the, one of the things that uh, Debbie and I realized as we were analyzing the data is that at different points in time, all of us violate some of those behaviors. But I think the difference is it's on an incidental basis. It's not a chronic thing that people do. You know, you might have an emotional blow up one day at work or feel crabby or something, 
but you know, these were people for whom this was pretty persistent, or it was sort of random and continued over time, like with emotional outbursts. Um, and so I think that it's helpful to keep in mind that difficult coworkers are, um, they're probably, uh, they're, they're separate from the rest of the workforce and the chronicness of the behavior. And the fact that other people say, yes, this person creates a problem and it's having these kinds of spillover effects. In your interviews, was there ever discussion of, this is a difficult employee that I dealt with, this is what happened and they actually changed? Because uh, <laughs> my experience, the difficult employees, you have the discussions with them, it doesn't change and either you know, move to a different you know, area or promoted or are fired. But did they ever change behavior? Um, there were a few instances where they modified their behavior a bit over time. Um, it's, it's hard to answer that question in part because some people worked with a difficult coworker for a very short period of time, whereas in some cases it was a much longer period of time. And so it's hard to make those comparable. And then also people would get shifted around across different positions. Um, and we ended up with a number of difficult coworkers who ended up quitting too. So I don't, you know, it's sort of hard to know, like if you have an intervention with a difficult coworker, what's the extent to which it will work? I suspect part of it may be a function of um, how you handle this discussion and holding them accountable for change and outline what the consequences are. Um, so it's, it's hard. I can give you an anecdotal uh, case. This is the company where we interviewed the 10 people. Small company, only had about 15 employees. And uh, the owner is a friend of mine. And she called me up in, this fall because she had an <coughs> And so I met with her and I went through, okay, what are the behaviors kind of out of the diff six different areas? And my own personal view is you probably can't change ethical standards. Like those tend to be pretty deeply ingrained. And if the person isn't capable of performing the job, probably not going to have a lot of luck with that <laughs> either. But the interpersonal, the emotional outbursts and so forth, maybe those are some things that you can work with. And so I gave her a set of... Um, you know, following this format, talk to she, the difficult coworker would get upset in meetings and then have very strong emotional reactions, start crying in front of other people, lashing out, and it was very disruptive. And I said, you know, you need to leave the room at that point and then come back when she's calmed down and say, this is not appropriate professional workplace behavior. We can give you some time to sort of, you know, calm yourself down, but this has to stop. And the last conversation I had with her, it seemed like those, be, you know, that approach seemed to be working with that person. But did it fix? And there were some other problems too, but that one it tended to reduce the incident. So it may depend in part on the problem too. Um, so in terms of holding people accountable for change, um, we did find 20% of people were disciplined, another 15% were fired. But we did have a couple people who were promoted, which goes to your question, Joe, about that. So it does seem to be, you know, maybe some people are using their difficulty to get ahead, so we're not. Did, did you study going into this whether or not companies had established grievance policies, whether they offered diversity training, whether their yep. benefits package had anger management programs? No. Nothing like that. Well, again, we were just trying to get the lay of the land in terms of who the difficult coworkers were. I think that's a great avenue to follow up. And what about when you talk about the, the consequences? Any thumb, you know, rule of thumb on a, on a price tag for these people? <laughs> so that's a great avenue for additional study as well. The small company where my friend is the CEO, I interviewed her about her difficult coworker. Um, this person, it's a small web-based company um, in Bethesda, and uh, the, the person was a web designer, and they were trying to come out with the next iteration of their service, their website and, and service model. And their difficult coworker was angry and aggressive. Um, they had actual documentation. She would spend the entire day on Facebook at work instead of doing actual work. And when they, could, when they confronted her about it, she got angry and accused the CEO of bullying her. So there were a whole, and then she would also pick on one particular other. So there were a whole host of issues there. And the, she ended up quitting the company. 
And when I asked my friend, you know, what's the cost? Like, you're in a position to know, what's the cost of the person? And she went through the lost productivity, um, the opportunity cost in terms of not being able to put out the next generation of their product, the spillover effects on other people. Um, we had to consult with the employment attorney about how to handle this situation. And she said, I think it was $50,000. And she only worked there for 11 months. Were there companies that told you, oh, by the way, we had a difficult person, we fired them, they sued us, now we're scared about being sued again? Well, remember, we just we went to the part-time MBA program as a start, and then our professional network. So we were just talking to individuals who worked with these folks. Um, there were a couple of people who felt that uh, the, the dysfunctional company with the property manager damaged the track. Uh, that company had actually been sued by someone who left because of the difficult property manager. But we didn't hear about any cases where people inside the company said, well, we fired them and then they sued us. So that, that may occur. I, if it does, I just don't know. Um, is your comment about talking with them about their behavior irrespective of their role in the organization or the hierarchy? Meaning, I think it would be different talking to your boss versus talking to your subordinate versus, or is it a comment on if you, as opposed to a, a colleague or same level saying actually you should be telling your manager to talk to them and it's, as a manager or supervisor you should be talking to them? So great question. Uh, I think that de depending on the particulars of the situation, it can be useful to talk to your boss about their behavior that creates difficulty for you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a lot more sensitive, <laughs> but I think it can be done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it has to be a very delicate conversation where, uh, you know, I'm trying to help the company and your disorganization or your, you know, the, these things that you do are creating problems for me and my ability to get my work. I think there's a way to say that where it doesn't come off as criticizing the boss. Um, there have been cases where people went up over the head of the boss and found a sympathetic ear. And I think if you consider those <coughs> visible consequences, you know, 400% turnover or, you know, uh, costs that are starting to rack up, that you can find a sympathetic ear at, at higher levels. Um, and in, in that case, Again, but I think the focus has to be on these are the behaviors that are causing problems, here are the consequences for other people, here's how it's creating dysfunction in this organization. That's my personal view, but I certainly wouldn't like encourage you to go charging out and confront your boss. Um, you showed the stats of like the I guess status of the employees. Did you look into any type of employee, whether it be a contractor, full-time employee, part-time employee, anything like that? Um, so these numbers are across all the different types of difficult coworkers. In general, I think people who were peers or direct reports tended to. I mean, it's much easier to. Like, was, was there any looking into like contractors and stuff? I, I just was interested in that dynamic. Or, uh, could it be a future avenue? I guess. <laughs> it could definitely be a future avenue. I definitely could. I can think of one case. There was a, a company that had a partner firm. They were working on an IT project. And the difficult co-worker was a programmer who worked in a different firm. And this guy uh, was so stubborn and inflexible. He used to go in and change other people's code <laughs> without telling him that he changed it. And he initially, on this project, he was the only one who knew kind of the legacy software that they were working with. So he had a particular expertise, but the longer they worked together, other people from other organizations developed that expertise. And in his case, eventually his contract was not renewed. Right? I mean, people were really aware that he was creating a lot of problems. Um, I guess I'd like to leave you on a final note, this idea of learn from them. Okay? I don't want to make this a story about, oh, difficult coworkers are horrible and they should be stamped out. Although I confess, when I started the project, my thought was, we have to get these people out of organizations. And what I learned from the <coughs> respondents was that in many cases, people felt that having to work with them and having to find constructive ways to work with them actually built their managerial skills. And so one of the things that it triggered in my mind is if we're going to find these people in organizations, 
we ought to be thinking about interventions that help people figure out how to work constructively with people when they're causing difficulty or creating problems. And that that might actually be a more effective avenue long term, because that way you're building the skills of you know, part of your workforce that's really helping you accomplish your goals, um, and also taking steps to address the person who is creating problems. So with that, um, this, these are a number of academic references. They're in the handouts that you have. And if you're looking for, um, you know, easier things to read, <laughs> um, I've got a bunch of... Uh, These are some books. Um, this one in particular, I think, is pretty good. Right? Coping with toxic managers, subordinates, and other different people. And um, this one is also is pretty good. I haven't read the others yet. So, at this point, any questions, comments, follow up? Anybody want to volunteer as a site for future research? <laughs> 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 Folks here work for them have employee assistant programs mm -hmm. and even have employee assistant staffs. I mean, Northrop Grumman has a big one, for example. Yeah. Um, they have, as Joe mentioned, all kinds of anger management programs, <coughs> um, psychological <coughs> counseling, whether to what extent they're successful or not. But well managed companies um, handle difficult employees, can handle difficult I think you're right. I, I, and I think part of it is they're so large they have maybe a stronger will because the spillover consequences are more severe right. if they don't. One of the worst organizations I've been with on handling difficult employees is the government. <laughs> <laughs> the merit system has something to do with that, but yeah. um, I have seen in uh, the defense in the state for 13 years. I have seen individuals who are difficult just because you can't fire them, just basically being put in court with no responsibilities and twiddling for thumbs. Right. I've seen it both in the state and federal level. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's interesting because there are procedures to terminate employees in the federal government, but I think the perception is that it's going to be a long, arduous process fraught with uh, setbacks and. And, and so I think part of, part of it is the actual system, the disciplinary system, and then I think there's a set of perceptions around that system that lead people to kind of throw up their hands at the beginning and say, why bother trying? Um, but, you know, yeah, we had a fair number of difficult government employees. Other questions? Just one more comment. It, it seems when you did this whole cross the spectrum type of study, there's a pool of people that would be difficult. And out of that pool, though, companies should be concerned because their difficulty leads to internal dysfunction <coughs> and loss of money. But then there's a subset of that that actually has direct impact on client interface, on revenue. But there's also an impact Maybe you got this person who, in the eyes of the client's good, and they're difficult, but it's been manageable. But are there trigger signs for the difficult people that do things that are effectively criminal, like embezzling, sabotage, <laughs> things like that, lying on their forms and things like that. And to the, the even, hopefully, rare outlier extent where there are these people that go to postal because wow. they're, they're just time bombs. There, there definitely are those folks. We didn't interview anybody who had experience with people who crossed the line into criminal activity or violence or those kinds of things. Um, but there has been a, some research on that. Um, but it's very difficult to study because it's a relatively low base rate phenomenon. And when you have a low base rate, it gets kind of difficult to try and figure out how to study it. Um, what those studies have suggested is that you know the people who quote unquote go postal often feel very aggrieved and a strong sense of injustice, and this is how they respond to it. Um, and that's as much as I can tell you about you know, in part because it is so difficult to study. Mm -hmm. Cindy, I, I know that you said most of the <coughs> users are 
peer relationships. Um, but even uh, in that case, were, were there um, folks who said, I saw this, this was predictable as we were hiring this person. Um, these, yeah. these are indicators, and that's what I'm trying to plug. What, what did you see as indicators prior to the, you know, the, the uh, agreement on everybody's part that this was a difficult uh, uh, So question. it's a difficult question to answer with this sample because we, we asked people, have you ever worked with someone? So sometimes they were in the organization and the person was hired. Sometimes they got hired into the organization and the person was already there. So, um, so I'm trying to think about the cases where the difficult coworker was hired in. Um, so, again, it gets kind of complicated because there were the people who weren't confident in the job from the start, and they could tell pretty quickly. Um, there was one case where the person I interviewed was the person's manager. The person had been hired in. She didn't make the decision to hire this person, but she had a lot of doubts about the person. But her manager said, no, this person has a PhD. We need him on this consulting project, blah, blah, blah. They brought him in, and the person uh, didn't fit with the rest of the team. The rest of the team was relatively young. This person was quite a bit older and from a different country. They didn't mingle well, and the work that the person did didn't fit with what the client wanted, which caused a whole bunch of delays and a whole bunch of problems and so forth. And she clearly felt from the beginning that the person wasn't a good fit, but was sort of overruled by other people. So I don't know if that gets at the question. Um, but if you're asking me as an HR professional, what would I write? I mean, I think we have a lot of great tools out there. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a study that dates back to 1989 um, by Hogan, and you've taken the Hogan development um, inventory, and they find that uh, a number of different tests on ethics and employee reliability can predict who's likely to engage in sabotage and you know tardiness and lateness. So there, there do seem to be some tests that will help you predict who's likely to be a problem in an organization. I think also involving a lot of people in the interview process, you can tell if there's going to be problems with disrespect in terms of how they treat you know, maybe the clerical staff versus the people that they're going to be working with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those things can really help. And then my personal belief is that if you have a 360 performance evaluation system, a number of our respondents said they either used it or they wished that their organization had used it because that very quickly identifies who the difficult coworkers are because you're getting that feedback from a number of different people who are likely to be affected by their work. I was going to ask about the um, 360 reviews, but yeah. that was something you had asked the respondents if there were um, yeah. before that. Well, <laughs> the, the person who was politically protected at the top of this government agency, it was clear early on that there were problems. And the um, people higher up in the agency <laughs> did a lot, actually, within the realm of what they could do. They brought in the Covey people to do a seven habits of, you know, successful people training. They brought in a coach for the person. They did put her through a 360. She cherry picked the people who filled it out. They found out about it and made her redo the 360 with a broader <laughs> range of people. And finally, um, this was about a four year process. They ended up reorganizing to, even though she was at an SES level and by law, had to supervise people to have that standing. They reorganized that part of the agency so that she's in a consultant position. She doesn't have anybody reporting to her. Yeah. <laughs> so that's <laughs> so that's the one time I know that a 360 was used to you know, identify problems. But we also had a couple of cases where we interviewed members of auditing staff who found uh, problems with the accounting procedures used, for example, a guy who was in charge of commercial loans who was also very sexist and difficult in a whole bunch of, you know, different ways. And um, they, I, our respondent was the main auditor on that project. And she kept track and made recommendations to the board of this bank of, you know, there's some accounting problems, irregularities in terms of the information, and went back six months later and found the same problems, they hadn't been cleaned up. 
And so the board was able to fire him. And she said, you know, we're talking commercial loans, you know, tens of millions of dollars that were not. She said, I always really thought he was getting kickbacks, but I couldn't prove it. So if you use your HR people and your auditing people in the right way, you can help yeah. them identify yeah. some of these. Well, I just wonder if it's like an absence of a good HR system and review system that is enabling a lot of the problems and helping with the lack of action. Because you don't maybe someone is great, you know, responding to their boss, but it's terrible. Like micromanages doesn't respond yeah. to feedback, and what do they care? They don't, they don't have a review coming down. <laughs> Well, I think, I guess, I hope that this work will ultimately persuade people to take some action rather than sort of sitting on their hands and feeling like, oh, I can't do anything about this. Because I hope you can see there are real consequences, you know, financial consequences, people consequences, client consequences. Um, and I think we sort of, we're, we take that ostrich approach, we stick our head in the sand and hope the problem will go away, and if I just avoid the person, you know, it won't be too much of an issue. If you're talking to other people and they're saying, this person is a problem, it's spilling over on a lot of other people. It's a larger issue than just a personality. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I'll turn it back over to Rosetta. All right. Well, thank you, Cindy. We appreciate it.